Hey family, this is Elder Topaz and I want to welcome you to the Mirrors and Microscopes broadcast, a reflective journey in how we do leadership and how we do life in the kingdom of God. I pray that this broadcast finds you doing well, blessed and favored even in the midst of this pandemic and crisis. I want to take a few moments to share an encouraging word with you. Listen, I am so excited about this series, The Disruption Dispatch My Gifts. If you had not had an opportunity to listen to parts one and two of this series, go back, listen, and get into the vein, and get into the mindset, and get into the heart, and get into the posture, and get into the spirit of where we are deep diving into and treading and tracking as it relates to this process. After I thought I had concluded the series, God began to minister to me and download more revelation as it relates to this area of our gifts and the activation of our gifts in the midst of such an uncommon and unfamiliar time and in such uncharted territory. Now, as long as God is downloading revelation and confirmation through this series, I'm committed to releasing it all until God decides to shift me in another direction. So if we are in this series through the remainder of 2020, I'm here for it. And I pray you are too. My desire is that this series will really help us move and shift into some things that God has really been trying to get us to move into and shift into this entire time, even before the pandemic. Now, although the pandemic came with some crazy events, it came with some testing, it came with some trials that have broken our hearts. Uh, It came with some death. It came with some unexpected twists and turns. It came with some tragedy. But, 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 it also came with some blessings. It also came with favor. It also came with provision. It also came with fresh ideas and creativity. It also came with a fresh anointing. It also came with reignited passion. And overall, It came with a recalibration in ideas that needed to be actualized, that needed to be realized, and that needed to be awakened. So before we dive all the way into this thing, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We magnify you. We give you glory, honor, and praise. God, we pray that in the midst of this series that we're getting ready to deep dive into, that you would continue to bring us some revelation to some things that we have gone through in the midst of this trying time, that it will bring some clarity to some things that we're currently wrestling with in the midst of this transition, that we're currently wrestling with in the midst of some shifting and some things that are happening in our lives that's all God-ordained. God is all ordained by you, Father. So I pray that as we navigate and tread these waters, God, that you will be equipped and that we will be equipped with the knowledge and the skill set and the spirit and the heart and the mind and the resources and the connections, God, to be able to come out on the other side of this better, to come out on the other side of this renewed, to come out on the other side of this with a fresh anointing, to come out on the other side of this empowered, to come out on the other side of this ready to run with the plans and purposes and the vision that you have already put down in our spirits. God, we thank you. We don't take it lightly, Father, that you have us and what we need in mind, that you are activating our gifts to a whole nother level, Father, that you are even blowing the dust off of some things that we truly have not been good stewards over. So God, even forgive us for not being good stewards over some of the things and the gifts we knew we were supposed to be walking in and walking into. But God, we decree and declare right now, Father, that we're going to take up this bed and walk and we're going to run with it. And we're going to be good stewards from this point forward over the things, over the plans, over the purposes, over the gifts that you have entrusted and bestowed upon us. God, we love you. And we thank you and we magnify you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. 
Amen. Amen. All right. Y'all ready? All right, let's do this. So this is just a recap of what we've gone through through part one and part two before I jump into uh, the rest of the series. So for part one, we define the disruption and dispatching process through the life of Joseph and outline some considerations when God disrupts our life pathway and journey just so he can prepare us and just so he can activate our gifts and send us out on assignment. So that's what we dived into in part one. In part two, we discussed some misconceptions and even some erroneous ideology about our gifting and begin to break down the three categories of spiritual gifts, which speaks to functionality. It speaks to assignment. It speaks to the environment that God is placing us in. It speaks to maturity and where we are in God. It speaks to seasons in our lives and how they change and how sometimes our assignments can change with the seasons that are changing in our lives. And it also speaks to temperament, the type of spirit that we need to have, the type of posture, the type of temperament that we need to have when God is putting us in a position to dispatch our gifts. But for this teaching, I want to back this thing up just a little bit and truly assess the disruption and dispatching process. Because if we are not careful, we will allow the impact of the disruption to overshadow God's purpose for allowing the disruption, which can block or hinder us from walking in the gifts God is wanting us to dispatch or wanting to dispatch in us. So if we claim and believe that God is in full control, then nothing happens in our lives that God does not allow. So we can't be angry. We can't be mad at God when there are disruptions that he is causing, that he is orchestrating in our lives so that he can get the very best out of us. So he can dispatch the gifts that are in us that are lying dormant. So we can't get mad at it. But what we need to understand and not do is get stuck in the affects and the effects of the disruption itself. We cannot get stuck in the affects, which speaks to the emotional side and us being in our heads about it, but also the effects, which speaks to the results and the fallout when the disruption happens. So some of us have allowed the disruptions in our lives to open the door to manifestations of pride, Manifestations of pettiness, manifestations of anxiety and fear, manifestations of insecurity and ignorance, and manifestations of manipulation. Y'all get it. I can go on and on. But it opens up the door to a very humanistic side of us that's not quite spiritual at times. Let's just be real. But it is what it is because if we would just keep it real and all the way 100, our humanity And divinity war more times than we're willing to admit. Our humanity and divinity, they war against each other a lot. And I can go on and on about that. But all of these blemishes and these ugly manifestations are weapons of mass distraction. Now, the word says in 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, the King James Bible says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty to God or mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. But I also like the New Living Translation of this verse. And it says, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. So when God disrupts and shakes things up in our lives, We have a tendency to default to human reasoning, right? Am I by myself on this? We get stuck in the disruption and oftentimes allow it to cause stagnation in our lives and allow it to cause an astigmatism to our vision and where God is taking us. And so instead of doing that, Instead of vacillating in stagnation, instead of vacillating in in a place of of astigmatism to our vision, we should allow the disruption to shift our mindsets into asking God, what is this disruption trying to teach me? 
And God, what are you trying to uh, to reveal to us through this disruption? Not just why this is happening. So don't just ask why, but the what about it. What are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to reveal? Because the quandary is the perplexity of it all is the why. Lord, what's the why? What's the why of this? And so our prayers to God should be, Lord, don't allow the disruptions in our lives to formulate into the weapons we used to use. Don't allow this disruption to take me back to a place where I retreat to comfortability or I retreat to what's comfortable or I retreat to a toxic place or I retreat to an unhealthy place because I'm hurt by the disruption or because I got my face cracked because of the destruction or this or the disruption or don't allow the disruption to feed my own selfish will versus really trying to seek what God's will is for us and for our lives in the midst of this disruption. So we have to be very careful and ask God to not allow what I'm feeling right now to take me back to old places, to take me back to old situations, to take me back to old ways of thinking, to take me back to old strategies, but to help me to propel forward in it so that I can get all that you're trying to get out of me in the midst of the disruption. So one thing that we have to also realize is that disruption is not necessarily a bad or negative thing at times. We make the association based upon how society defines disruption. But can I be honest? Can I be real honest? When I look back over my life and I start reflecting on God's disruptions in my life, those disruptions were needed and necessary. Listen, transparent moment. I'm glad God disrupted my failed marriage. At the time, I was hurt. I felt defeated. I was suicidal. I was embarrassed, you know, because we were featured in Jet Magazine in the late 90s. And so you know how it was when you're in the Jet Magazine, you know, you think you're doing something. Um, I had low self-worth because I was thinking to myself, you know, who's going to want me after this divorce with these three little kids that I have to raise? You know, and there's some other things I thought, you know, who, who's going to want me? I'm broken. You know, my marriage failed. You know, I'm, I, I, I just don't, I, I feel like I, my life is falling apart. But when I started reflecting on the marriage itself, it was not God ordained. And I knew that, but my pride and my weakened self caused me to enter into the union. Anyway, it was a convenient compromise because I was in a wilderness season in my life. And when you are in a wilderness season in your life, you have to be so careful about how you operate when you are in a wilderness season in your life. Because when you're in a wilderness season, you make destiny-like decisions or you make destiny-ish decisions based upon a temporary or temporal place in your life. My wilderness during that season was a temporary residence, but it wasn't home. I was in a place which was so far away from God. Home for me is that place where the presence of God is. Home for me is a place where I'm fortified, a place where I'm refreshed, a place where I'm renewed, a place where I'm sustained, a place where I feel a fresh wind. That's home for me. And during the wilderness season in my life, I felt like I was a runaway from home. I compromised in just about every area of my life. And none of those compromises were a true reflection of who I was in God. I offered in that season of my life, I offered a contaminated, a bootleg, a counterfeit, and an imitation version of who I was. I married during a place of great hypocrisy in my life. I was living my life in a state of sleep and slumber. Like I was sleepwalking. And when I finally woke up 
and came to and realized that the marriage was suffocating my purpose in God, y'all, I started devising an exit plan. I'm not even going to lie. I started planning a getaway plan. It was like I was clicking my heels like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz shouting, there's no place like home because I had had enough. So when I look at that disruption in my life, although it didn't feel good, although it caused some pause in my life, it was good for me. Although the effect, the effects of that disruption was not what I expected or imagined. It was truly for my good. And all I can say is that I'm okay with it. I have a peace about it. And I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I'm not pointing fingers at the other person. Because what I understand is what it says in Romans 8 and 28. That all things are working for good. To them that love God and who are the called according to his purpose. So after I began to break out and come out from under the rubble of that disruption that I felt like had taken me out at the time. After that divorce, I rededicated my life back to Christ. I joined a ministry that literally resuscitated me and loved me back to life. I started serving again. And I began to rediscover my gifts and his purpose for my life. Newsflash. God's glory is being revealed through the disruption and dispatching process in your life. Just like it was in my life. There is purpose in the disruption. Everything that God allows in our lives is intentional. It's targeted. It's specific. It's customized. It's tailor-made. It's fitted. It's fashioned and designed for what God has purposed for our lives and for our gifts and for the gifts that he has endowed us with. So I want to illuminate and bring forth three areas that God deals with in his disruption and dispatching process in our lives. And if I'm not able to get through all three, then I will continue with the next installation um, in this series. But let's talk about three things in three areas that God brings forward and that he deals with in his disruption and dispatching process. Number one, he deals with productivity in and with the things of God in the kingdom. So if there's a disruption in your life, check your productivity in God. Are you doing what he's asked you to do? Are you doing what he's called you to do? Have you been wavering, vacillating between what you want to do and what God is requiring for you to do? Number two, he's dealing with our kingdom value. Oftentimes we don't feel or see the totality of who God has called us to be. And the value and cost of the oil and anointing are in our lives. And because of that, we don't acquiesce to the level that we should. We settle for a diluted version of God's design. And in that place, in that diluted version of God's design, that's the place where the enemy begins to toy with our mind and our thought process. To try to make us feel like we're not worthy of God's glory on and in our lives. And we know that's not so. And the third area, he wants to deal with our vision. Because if we can't see where God is taking us, then where are we ultimately going? Those are the three areas. Productivity, kingdom value, and vision. So let's jump into productivity. Because in productivity, when we have disruptions in our lives, we can get frustrated because we feel stagnant in the midst of the disruption. And God has to put our gifts in its proper place and functionality and and for proper use. Because apparently, we're not doing that. And so the, the, the disruption... God has to, in the midst of that, put our gifts in its proper use and function and place so that our passion won't be misplaced. 
And so we won't continue to pour our passion into meaningless encounters, into people who will mishandle it and into people who will let it fall to the ground so we can stop producing Ishmael's in our lives and illegitimates. Now I'm from the country. So back in the day, we used to call it Ill- illegitimates. And that's when things were produced outside of the will of God. So he even causes disruptions to keep us from producing Ishmael's in our lives. And so God causes these disruptions to arrest us and stop us from giving away and giving way to idols in our lives. To give way to counterfeit things in our lives versus the the authenticity that God desires for us to walk in. He wants us to do things his way and we keep trying to do it our way. And because of that, we have to understand that God is not a mediocre God. He does not specialize in mediocrity because mediocrity is comfortable. And God has not called us to comfortable Christianity. So if you look at the caliber of assignment that was asked from some of the people in the Bible. If you look at the caliber of assignment when it came to places of disruption in some of the people of God's lives in the Bible, it was an uncomfortable position. So that assignment and purpose could be fulfilled. We've talked about Noah. We looked at the life of Joseph and those disruptions. We talked about Moses. Let's look at Mary. Think about Mary in the conception of Jesus Christ. Oh my God, what a disruption to Mary's life. She's a virgin minding her own business. And here comes God causing a disruption to the trajectory of her life. It disrupts her relationship with her significant other. It disrupts her reputation. It disrupts her credibility. It disrupts her very existence. So the birth of the Messiah can come forth. Wow, what a disruption to her life. Look at the caliber of assignment on her life just so the Messiah could come forth. When you look at the conversion of Saul to Paul, and we're going to look at that a little bit later in the series, but on one hand, you have Saul who's hating on and killing Christians, and then he has this disruption and this encounter With God, with the spirit of God in his life that literally knocks him off his horse. And now the very thing that he's known for despising has now become his battle cry. What a disruption. Look at the caliber of assignment that was on his life. So much so that purpose was fulfilled in his life. So just think about these questions. I got some questions for you. Ask yourself these. What if God is trying to bring true conversion in your life? Like a Saul to a Paul or like a Jacob to a, like an Israel to an Abram to an Abraham. Like a Sarai to a Sarah moving you from a place that replicates the fall of Adam. Instead of moving you and trying to move you to a place that replicates the resurrection power of Jesus. Yes, you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but there are areas in our lives that have not experienced a full conversion. Is that possible? Absolutely. So through these disruptions, God is trying to bring full conversion in some areas in your life. What if God is trying to work on your love walk? How you love is so important. How you receive love is important. And maybe even God is introducing you to what it means to really be loved and what really what love really is. What if God is trying to deliver you from tradition and the status quo? What if God is trying to make your life a living testimony so much so that when others look at you and look at your life, And they say, if God can transform them, he can transform me. I know there's a God. Our lives are living epistles read of men daily. I know this is a sad truth and it's a harsh truth. 
but it is what it is. Some of us are the only Bible that some people will ever read. Second Corinthians three, two and three in the living Bible states it like this. It says the only letter I need is you yourselves by looking at the good change in your hearts. Everyone can see that we have done a good work among you. They can see that you are a letter from Christ written by us. It is not a letter written with pen or ink, but by the spirit of the living God. Not one carved on stone, but one carved in human hearts. Just a quick example. As a teen, I used to be excited to receive love letters from my high school sweetheart. And read the expressions of love and how he missed me and how he adored me and how much he meant me. And we know that in in these days and times, uh, letter writing is, is a lost form. But just like those love letters that I was excited about as a teenager, I feel the same way about the things of God. And when we receive a word or God uses us to minister to others, It's like he uses us as love letters dispatched out to his people to let them know that he hears them, to let them know that he loves them, to let them know that he has them covered and he has their backs. So he uses our lives as love letters to confirm that he yet lives and dwells in us as instruments and vessels to be used and dispatched out. And to encourage someone that if he can turn the chicken scratch of our lives around. And if he can turn what we thought was illegible in our lives and unable to be read into a love letter signed and sealed by the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Then listen, I'll be that. I will be that to let someone know that if he can turn our lives around into an epistle and love letter signed and sealed by God. That's encouragement to someone out there to let them know that he can do the same for them. So really ponder this. God using your life and your testimony and your challenges and your disruptions as love letters to others to signify his power in the earth. Then think about that. Be that. Pray on that. But still in the vein of productivity and and disruption, it reminds me of when Jesus curses the fig tree and how we can be too comfortable remaining in a state or a perceived state or a perceived uh, state of perpetual uh, barrenness in our lives. And Jesus went to the fig tree expecting fruit because he saw the leaves. And sometimes on the outside, We look like we have it together. Sometimes on the outside, we look real spiritual. But woe be unto us to look like we're fortified and to look like we're a source of life or a lifeline or to look like we're a source of sustenance or to look like we're anointed or to look like we're walking in purpose or to utter cliches or to make our tongue sound pure and uncontaminated or to have a rehearsed praise or dance, but not have anything of substance to pour out. Woe be unto us. God's intention is for us to bear fruit and produce fruit that will feed, sustain, and help to fortify others. There is an authenticity that God wants to produce in and through you. And some of you need to realize and understand that you are allowing the disruption to sit on your gift. I'm going to say that again. Some of you need to realize that because the disruption is happening, instead of seeing what God is doing, you're allowing the disruption to sit on your own gift. And you're fighting against God's purpose. And that's not God's design. So as I bring this to a close, Because my time is already spent for this installment. But just remember, for this installment, go back, listen to this, pray on this. That in these three areas, when we talk about disruptions, 
He's dealing with, with us with productivity, with kingdom value, and with vision. All right, so next time we'll talk about kingdom value. But in the vein of productivity, as I bring this to a close, I want to minister to someone who has experienced church hurt. And you're allowing that experience to stifle your growth. You're allowing it to skew your perspective or to cloud your judgment regarding the things of God. Can I tell you that God wants to turn your petty into power? That forgiveness is not for them. It's for you. God has chosen you and he desires to stop the bleeding. But you keep choosing your pain over process. Allow him to heal you in that place. Allow him to pour into you. So you can pour into those he has called you to. He wants to dispatch you out, but you keep pumping the brakes. You keep making excuses. God wants to use what you went through to heal and to set free and to deliver others. But the healing must start with you. So let's start it today. Use this time during this pandemic because the doors of the church building are closed now. It's just you and God. So take this time that God has ordained to reestablish your relationship with him, to receive a fresh anointing, to let the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit resuscitate his purpose in your life and to move forward and to get back in place. You've been sitting on your gift for far too long. It's time to come out. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you for everyone who took time, Father, to dive a little deeper into our purpose in regards to the disruption and dispatching process in our lives. Father, we ask, Father, that you would continue, Lord, to use us for your glory, Father. And if there's anyone on this call who is not saved or anyone who is in a backslidden condition or anyone who has experienced church hurt and you know that God is dealing with you in this season, is dealing with you in the midst of this pandemic and crisis, I just want you to just repeat after me in the midst of this prayer. Dear God, I need you. I'm humbly calling out to you. I'm tired of doing things my way. Help me to start doing things your way. I invite you into my life to be my Lord and Savior. Fill every empty place in me with your Holy Spirit and make me whole again. Lord, help me to trust you like never before. Help me to love you like never before. Help me to live my life for you like never before. Help me to understand your grace. Help me to understand your mercy. Help me to understand your peace. God, I thank you. I love you and I give you glory. It's in Jesus name. Amen. So if you pray this prayer, you have been reconciled back into the things of God. I love you and I thank you and I appreciate you so much. And I look forward to you joining me the next time for our next installment of the Disruption Dispatch My Gifts. Until then, take care. And God bless.